things were so bad that uh, I had to fly up to New York and meet with rating agencies before being sworn in to avoid a guaranteed downgrade to junk status. We should have been America's Greece. Let me uh, tell you, the recent foundation certainly makes me feel right at home, and I, I, I truly mean it. And I'm glad and honored that you are holding this meeting here in San Juan. And I am grateful for the work uh, you all do, but most importantly, for the principles you stand for. My friend uh, Grover Norquist has said, and I quote, to understand where America will be in 10 years, read reason today. And I wholeheartedly agree. And that makes me optimistic about the future of our nation. One issue, on issue after issue, the people are, con are coming around to common sense solutions that are at the very core of Reason's mission. That is certainly the case in Puerto Rico and in an increasing number of states led by my fellow governors. So it is that this recent weekend 2012 takes place in an exciting context and at what I see as a promising juncture. I am the eternal optimist. <laughs> it is an exciting context uh, indeed because here we are in Puerto Rico. God works in mysterious ways, as my grandma used to say. Who would have thought that this territory of the United States would come so far, so fast, in turning the tide of big government and unleashing the power of the free market and individual freedom in just three short years. And that's the story I want to share with you all tonight. It is a story that starts with what just three years and one month ago was the deepest recession and worst fiscal situation in our nation. In fact, when I took office, our deficit stood at $3.3 billion, representing 44% of revenues. Proportionally speaking, it was the highest in the nation. Worse than uh, recent homeland of California. <laughs> I had to say that, I'm sorry. Out of the 50, and actually, your governor hasn't called me to take some notes on what we're doing here. <laughs> Anyhow, out of the 50 states, out of the 50 states in Puerto Rico, we were dead last, the 51st, in the 51st position at that time. Uh, actually, things were so bad that uh, I had to fly up to New York and meet with the rating agencies before being sworn in to avoid a guaranteed downgrade to junk status. We should have been America's Greece. Actually, it was so bad we didn't have enough money to meet our first payroll. We had to take out a loan. I must say my wife asked me if we could ask for a recount on the, on the vote. <laughs> it didn't work out. Today, as we speak, our deficit is down to just over $600 million, or 7% of revenues. In proportional terms, 36 states currently have higher deficits than Puerto Rico. We are ranked number 15, and we're closing in very quickly. So what have we been doing? Like a lot of like-minded governors, we have been right-sizing our government and reining in spending. And when we say reining in spending and cutting spending, it's real cuts, not Washington cuts. <laughs> We really don't have a choice, because unlike the federal government, we don't print money at the state level. <laughs> In my case, as you all meant, as you, Tom mentioned, I started by cutting my own salary, much to the degree of my wife. <laughs> cutting the cabinet members' salaries, much to the degree of their spouses. <laughs> and eliminating 30% of all the political appointee positions. But, Between voluntary and mandatory reductions in the workforce, we shrunk our government force by more than 21,000 in the first year. And actually, in the first three years, we just got our numbers of this administration, we have reduced the number of government employees 
by more than 36,000. That's also more proportionally than any state of the union, and in absolute numbers by, I, I believe, any state in the union. And if the moon were to become a state as well, also in the moon, I think we'll call <laughs> So uh, about 8,000 of them in the year one left voluntarily. They retired early. Government payroll is now down by about a billion dollars a year. Overall government spending is down by more than 15, actually close to 20%. At the same time, we began enacting pro-growth policies to energize the private sector. Because at the end of the day, a sustainable recovery, whether at the state or national level, needs a combination. It needs both fiscal responsibility and pro-growth policies. Policies like the P3 program David Alvarez discussed this morning and which led to what happened last year. I hope you enjoyed David's presentation. In 2011, the largest single infrastructure investment in the nation was our $1.5 billion toll road concession. And I'll get back to that and the pro-growth policy side in a moment. Like many states, we're also tackling the challenge of funding our retirement system. On the positive side, we're among the few jurisdictions under the American flag that already eliminated defined benefit plans. So we have eliminated the risk of widening actuarial deficits. This past, uh, <laughs> this past three years, we also took the steps necessary to improve liquidity and extend the life of the central government's retirement system assets by almost eight years. Our record speaks for itself. And we are more determined than ever to live up, live up to our motto, which is Puerto Rico does it better. Our progress on the fiscal side, in addition to promising progress on the economic side as a result of smart pro-growth policy, has led to positive evo e evaluations by the rating agencies of the kind Puerto Rico had not seen in decades, almost, almost 27 years. Between 2001 and 2007, because of mismanagement and the nonstop erosion of the government's fiscal situation, Standard & Poor's alone took six consecutive neg negative actions against Puerto Rico's credit. In, in April of 2010, Moody's acknowledged the success of our fiscal stabilization plan when it upgraded Puerto Rico's credit rating from the level right before junk to A3 a bigger improvement than any other state or territory. We also got our first positive outlook from a credit rating agency in nearly three decades. Those positive ratings actions took into account fiscal progress, but also our new direction on our overall economic front, a direction very much in tune with the values that are shared and championed by the recent foundation. Because all the while we have been putting our fiscal house in order, we've also been changing the course of our future. Puerto Rico's pro-growth economic reform program has entailed a series of key public policy reforms. To kick it off, given our limited public investment capacity, we passed the most advanced public-private partnership law in the nation. Through our P3 program, we're moving forward about $3.5 billion in infrastructure projects. Our first P3 in 2010 was to get our public schools into the 21st century. We're investing over $878 million in a school modernization program that also goes head in hand with curricular reform. And by the way, I appreciate the work the recent foundation is doing on school choice. Thank you. I believe in choice. For sure, and I speak as a parent, as a father, for sure parents have a better understanding of what is best for their kids. Up until last year, here in Puerto Rico, we had a state Supreme Court that stood in the way of it. But in the la past three years, I've had the opportunity to appoint a majority of justices to our state Supreme Court. And all of those justices favor school choice. It just happens that, that, that that's the way. <laughs> 
school choice is a major reason why we can be optimistic about our future. And I intend to do a lot more about it now that I have uh, justices to back it up. <laughs> Puerto Rico also completed permitting reform. Instead of going to 21 different agencies, businesses can now go to just one single permits office to get their endorsements. Or better off, just get online on PR.gov. Another major driver of Puerto Rico's rebound is tax reform. As a territory, Puerto Rico has a mirror code to the Internal Revenue Code. Just over a year ago, we enacted the biggest tax reform in our island's history. As a result, the top corporate tax rate immediately dropped from 41% to 30%. The previous seven-tier corporate bracket was simplified into three lower rates, 20, 25, and 30 percent. And starting in 2014, we will have just two brackets, 20 and 25. So that means our top corporate tax rate will be 25 percent. For, and by the way, in the meantime, we have dramatically simplified our, our you know, our filing, you know, our, our tax returns, and uh, so it will be a lot easier to file our tax returns this year. For individuals, we have reduced tax rates an average of 25%. Over the next five years, that reduction is set to increase to nearly 50%. It will be a sliding scale. But those reductions are tied by law to staying on our two-lane road of fiscal responsibility and pro-growth policies. We've made our taxpayers the guardians of fiscal responsibility and pro-growth policies. In other words, individual tax reductions for the years 2014 through 2016 are contingent on the government meeting targeted goals in operating expenses, revenues, and economic growth. I want the taxpayers to keep us you know, in check. In addition, 1% of the island's budget in 2014 and 1.5% in 2015 and 2016 will be deposited into a fiscal reserve fund. This reform significantly improves Puerto Rico competitiveness. It has improved Puerto Rico 15 positions in its global tax ranking. To further spur investment, last fall we also launched the best housing market incentives in the country. They are available to residents and non-residents alike. So if you want to stay around, and <laughs> feel free. And they are available up until December of this year. The incentives include no property taxes for five years for new residential properties purchased during this special window. In addition to no capital gains tax obligation with no expiration date. And by the way, the elimination of the capital gains tax was made permanent in a later bill. And purchases of existing properties actually benefit from a 50% exemption on capital gains. For those who may buy either a new or existing property to rent during that time frame, you're also eligible for zero tax obligation for, five, for 10 years on net rental income. Consider what, has been, consider what has been happening in the residential real estate market in the country as a whole compared to Puerto Rico. Between the time we enacted those incentives in September of 2010 and November of last year, new home sales on the island jumped 60%. In the country as a whole, new home sales were down 6% during the same period of time. By the same token, existing home sales on the island grew by 26.5%, while overall U.S. growth was an anemic 1.8%. Our latest economic measures are also designed to reverse population decline that Puerto Rico experienced in the last decade. This year, we have put into place laws that promote residency and attract capital. For qualified investors and individuals, we are providing a 4% income tax rate during a 20-year period with a special tax decree as well as exemptions on tax payments on interest and dividends. This is on top of the entrepreneurship incentives we have already put in place for current residents. Puerto Rico is on the rebound and entering a new era of sustainable growth. 
For the first time since 2007, total employment is up, and the unemployment rate is moving in the right direction, down by two full percentage points compared with the previous year. In December, employment in the private sector experienced its biggest increase in nearly five years. Last year, more than 14,000 new corporations were created, the highest rate of new company development in our history. A rebound has also been recognized by the World Economic Forum. In global competitiveness among 142 jurisdictions around the world, Puerto Rico climbed last year from position 41 to 35. We have indeed changed the course of Puerto Rico's future, and we will not stop until we get the job done. That includes tackling the fundamental issue of the island's ultimate political status destiny. Territorial status for a land and population of American citizens, natural born American citizens of, the si of this size was never meant to go on and on and on with no destination in sight. That's not what the founding fathers intended to see happen. And the only ultimate destination consistent with being citizens of this great nation of ours is statehood. But that's for the people to decide, and they will do so this November. On election day, in addition to deciding whether we want to continue to move our rebound forward or go back to the failed policies of the past, voters here will also choose whether or not they want to maintain the island's current status as a territory. But irrespective of whether a majority of Puerto Ricans want to change territorial status or not, it's also important in high time that voters express their preference for an ultimate destination. There are three, statehood, independence, or a pact of free association between so two sovereign nations. The outcome of the vote will be decisive in changing the course for the future. You all know I believe what my preference is. I think if we have been good enough to have fought side by side in the trenches, in every single war in the last century and this century, by the way, oftentimes in greater numbers than most states. To give you an idea, since 9-11, we have contributed over 21,000 men and women in uniform to the global war on terror. Our number is greater than 45 states. So uh, if, if we are good enough to be in the trenches, we're also good enough to fully participate in the decision-making process in America. And when we come to the table as equals, I am convinced we will have much to contribute and enrich our nation. I look forward to forging that future together. And I thank you for choosing Puerto Rico as uh, your location for this year's conference. Since I mentioned school choice, uh, Tom, if you could come over here. I have a proclamation commemorating School Choice Week in Puerto Rico, which is a signal of things to come down here. And I want to give you uh, this proclamation. And hopefully, the next time we see each other, we'll be well on our way to implement school choice fully in Puerto Rico. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Do you want to see? Hi, uh, Governor uh, Fortuno. Uh, President Obama has also been in office for three years. <laughs> yes, I know. Has, uh, <laughs> my question is, has he asked you for any advice along the way? Yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> he came down last summer, actually. Uh, and uh, I, I raised a number of issues that are affecting us to begin with. Uh, the same way that uh, a lot of people demand that our border be protected uh, in the southwestern part of the nation, I ask that our border be protected here as well. And, uh, and he, he simply did not react to that at all. And I also raise issues that I have with EPA uh, and the way it's killing jobs in Puerto Rico and all across America. Governor, you, you've done the heroic thing in making the cuts, but are you winning the hearts and minds? And I asked this in the context of, we talked about a year and a half ago, and you said your advice to other politicians is to do it like a Band-Aid, do make the cuts quickly. And like Ronald Reagan and 
others, eventually the public would see the benefit and come around. And so we researched that and we found Ronald Reagan and one state governor and we couldn't find many others. Um, and are you popular? Is this well, let me tell you, I'll give you my numbers. I'll be happy to share my numbers with you. A year ago, I was not electable. Actually, I was not presentable. <laughs> uh, back in November, all polls had me tied with my contender. And we have recent numbers from a few weeks ago, and I would win a race here. So and we're still you know, some, some you know, months away from the election. I am convinced we're going to win. Uh, uh, we have closed that gap. It was about a, a 20 plus percent gap. Again, by last November, it was, again, a virtual tie. And by now, I'm ahead. And we have our momentum with us. Uh, to give you an example, uh, on the economic front, home sales are up, as I mentioned. Car sales are up. Retail sales are up. Cement sales are up. And for the first time in six years, employment numbers moved into positive territory. Uh, but then again, I'm, I work hard the next, for the next 10 months. Uh, but if, if I were you know, to have an election today, I would win. So it's doable. Uh, you, you mentioned the destination, where you're heading. The top 1% earners, there's so many of, of us that are leaving the United States. There's so many people in state legislators that are looking and talking. There's talks on how to disconnect and secede from the union. Why in God's name, man, would you want to join this place? <laughs> and, and, and by being independent, which is your other option, I think this would, it would be such a magnet to all those very wealthy people that are leaving to come here. They don't want to come here because it's a territory. <laughs> well, uh... Uh, let, let me tell you, we, we are natural born American citizens, as I mentioned, and, and we're proud of that. And we're proud of uh, the service of so many thousands and thousands of our young men and women in uniform for our nation. And I, again, I'm, I'm an optimist. Otherwise, I would not be holding this job. Uh, and uh, I truly believe that things have to get worse to get better. I am convinced we are, the conditions are ripe for major transformations at the national level. And, uh, and I'm hopeful that I'll be, uh, you know, one among many governors at the state level that uh, will be assisting in making sure that it happens in Washington. Uh, that transformation has to take uh, many, many fashions. I'll tell you about, about here, because here, uh, for example, with a state legislature, uh, it's been very difficult uh, at times to uh, stay the course of fiscal responsibility. Uh, even though we have a clear majority and, and they have been supportive, but it, it, is, it is tough. Uh, you know, I, I have a pen that I use for vetoes and I use it often. Uh, one thing we're doing, since we are shrinking the size of the executive branch, if the voters agree with uh, what I, uh, suggested and, and, and actually was approved by the state legislature, we would shrink the size of our state legislature by 30%. This August, August 19th, I believe, uh, we will actually, uh, the voters will have a, cho a chance to determine if they also want to shrink the size of the state legislature. I believe it's going to be an eight to two uh, uh, issue. And I believe it's going to be a clear majority in favor of amending our constitution, uh, the state constitution, to, to uh, actually reduce the size of our state legislature. I still believe common sense uh, can be uh, actually uh, saved uh, from the uh, hands of those uh, uh, in power, and that the voters, generally speaking, earlier sooner or later, they will be able to take control of their lives and, 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 and control uh, that government. So again, we are American citizens. We're proud of that. Uh, I have over 200,000 veterans here. 
how can I just you know, tell them that, you know, let's walk away from our history? Plus, independence is favored by 2.5%. So in Alaska, there's a stronger pro-independence movement than here. <laughs> it's double digits, uh, really. Uh, so uh, what we want to do is we want to be part of that revolution uh, that I'm convinced will occur and will change Washington. Thank you.